Good evening, I'm Diana Skye and you're watching a special edition of World News. Tonight, we focus on the U.S. presidential elections. Donald Trump has been elected as the 47th president of the United States, securing a decisive victory over his Democratic rival Kamala Harris. Now, with 51% of the vote, Trump gained critical support in key battleground states and sent shockwaves across the globe. Now, this marks a historic comeback for the former president, who four years ago refused to accept his defeat, incited a violent insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, has faced felony convictions, and survived two assassination attempts. So I want to thank the American people for the extraordinary honor of being elected your 47th president and your 45th president. And to every citizen, I will fight for you, for your family and your future. This will truly be the golden age of America. That's what we have to have. Donald Trump looks to have completed a historic political comeback in the U.S. election, with Republicans sweeping aside the Democrats in key states across America. Now, our chief political correspondent, Aaron Dammon, joins us live from Capitol Hill. Good evening, Aaron. Now, reports are that just recently Kamala Harris has called Donald Trump. What can you tell us about this? Good evening, Diana. Yes, as we go to air tonight, confirmation that Kamala Harris has conceded the election to Donald Trump. I repeat, Kamala Harris has conceded the US election of 2024 to Donald Trump. Now, citing a senior aide, CNN reports that Harris, quote, discussed the importance of a peaceful transfer of power and being a president for all Americans. Now, a person familiar with uh, the president and her campaign tells CNN the call only lasted a few minutes. In just over two hours, she will finally appear at her alma mater, Howard University, right here in Washington, to give a formal concession speech in front of her supporters and addressing the nation. Exactly what shape that concession speech will look like, well, we will wait and see. But as I mentioned, Donald Trump is now president-elect because Kamala Harris has conceded this election. That's right, Aaron, but this isn't the only, uh, the only uh, significant result from election night. Now, what can, we tell, uh, what can you tell us about in, um, the results of the Senate and the House? That's right. As you mentioned earlier, I'm here in front of Capitol Hill and the battle for Congress continues. This will determine just how much influence Donald Trump actually has in the White House and it's looking good for him. The Senate has flipped red. It has flipped Republican and Republicans also hold a lead in the House. This means that there could be very little or even no checks on Donald Trump's power once he ascends to the presidency and who he surrounds himself with here will be critical and Europe of course will be looking to the Secretary of State position. We're seeing talk around the likes of former US Ambassador to Germany Rick Grenell, Senator Mark Rubio or even former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien. All of those people could take that role and others of course are in the mix too. Whoever takes up the Secretary of State position will have a crucial role in selling American foreign policy. For any formal appointments, we'll have to wait some time yet. Well, Donald Trump's cabinet is clearly shaping up. Thank you so much, Aaron Demon, reporting to us live from Capitol Hill. We'll be coming back to you throughout the day. Now, after the election results, European leaders are preparing for Donald Trump's presidency. Now, fearing that Washington would cut off its support for Ukraine, force Europe to invest more in its own defense, or dictate harsh trading conditions for the bloc, EU leaders are entering real politique mode in which the old continent will have to build new bridges to the U.S. Pavel Chaskovsky has more. With the winner of US presidential elections emerging in the early Wednesday hours of European time zones, congratulations started to flood in from virtually all leaders on the continent. 
Emmanuel Macron was the first head of state of a major US ally to congratulate Trump on his re-election. Congratulations, President Donald Trump. Ready to work together as we did for four years. With your convictions and mine. With respect and ambition. For more peace and prosperity. Although Trump and Macron's cooperation was marred by hiccups, such as Macron calling NATO brain dead and Trump mocking the French president's low approval ratings, both leaders established a close relationship during their first terms as presidents. We have a tremendous relationship. Uh, we're discussing trade, uh, we're discussing NATO, we're discussing a lot of different things. And hopefully in the end it'll all work out. In an interview for TVP World, former European Commissioner Peter Bolas disclosed two more names from Europe that have Trump's ear. Giorgia Meloni, uh, who could find a, a language, a communication channel uh, with Donald Trump. Another person uh, who is now in a new position is Mark Rutte, the former uh, Dutch uh, Prime Minister, who is now uh, the Secretary General of NATO. During his campaign, Trump reiterated numerous times that US help to NATO allies is dependent on their paying their fair share when it comes to defense. That's why in his congratulations, Mark Rutte highlighted the ever-increasing defense expenditures of NATO member states. When President-elect Trump takes office again on January 20th, he will be welcomed by a stronger, larger and more united alliance. As to Maloney, the Italian Prime Minister made headlines earlier this year for her close relationship with Elon Musk, Trump's staunch supporter. It's an honor to be here and uh, to uh, introduce, I guess, and, and uh, convey the award to someone who is uh, uh, even more beautiful on the inside than she is on the outside, uh, Georgia Maloney. Also Maloney, whose conservative political outlook seems to closely align with Trump's, has her voice heard in Brussels. Contrary to, for example, Viktor Orban, who's been Trump's most vocal supporter in Europe. I see a shining victory, perhaps the biggest comeback in the history of Western politics. But Orban, who, according to some experts, is a political pariah in the EU, with growing dependence on Russian and Chinese business, might not be a valuable partner for the new US president. But knowing that Mr. Trump is also very transactional in approach, I wonder if Mr. Orban can have anything else to offer uh, on the European turf. However, Trump has even received an invitation from Orban to the European policy meeting held in Budapest on Thursday. It's highly unlikely that he will attend, even online, but Europe will undoubtedly wait for Trump's first gestures toward the old continent. Donald Trump's reclaiming of the White House may pose some challenges for the transatlantic relationship. Our European affairs correspondent Sasha Farbach has this next report. Now, Brussels realized that there will be a new resident in the White House. It'll be Donald Trump. Now, not just by a short margin, but by a large number growing support across the board in the United States. So that means a lot. And of course, that relationship between the United States and Europe matters. That's everything from trade policy, also to defense for NATO, on looking at how the war will continue in Ukraine, what kind of membership potentially might now be on the cards or not at all. So security has become one of the main issues that when we spoke to different policymakers here, and it was clear that there was potentially some concerns, but also pragmatism. Let's take a listen. Well, the first reaction is a surprise of the magnitude of the win. I know some people have, may have predicted that. It wasn't by reading mainstream media, by uh, listening to um, the main polls, it was not on the cards. The future looks like uh, unpredictable, um, but we need to wait. Uh, we need to cooperate uh, very quickly with the new administration, I mean Poland and, and Europe as well. We need to continue this cooperation. And with that, of course, what matters here as well is the European Commission, that executive arm of Europe, and also matters what has said. But rather than uh, frustration, uh, it was very much seen as um, a partnership that could work on the right circumstances. And let's listen now to what one of the Commission representatives had to say to us. Look, there is a transatlantic bond between the European Union and the United States keeping us together and um, we really uh, are ready to work on a very serious, strong transatlantic agenda in the years to come. So overall, with what's happened in the United States, 
perhaps not to great fanfare in Brussels and European institutions, but there is a willingness here, no matter if that's defense policy, if that's trade or technology looking into the future, there is very much a stoic pragmatism here that's apparent from across different political grounds moving forward and building on something that can work between the United States and the European Union and Europe as a whole. That's Sasha Farbach for TVP World in Brussels. Europe needs to take more responsibility for its safety. Now, this is the main message coming from Polish government officials after Republican candidate Donald Trump won the U.S. presidential election. Concerns over the course of the war in Ukraine are more present than ever. Our Kazimierz Wyszak reports from Warsaw. Here in Poland, you can truly feel the weight on the shoulders of government officials after the U.S. presidential election. The wind of history blows ever stronger. Poland's leadership will rise to the challenge. Poland will be taking over the presidency and the Council of the European Union starting in January 2025. About the same time Donald Trump will be sworn in as 47th president of the United States. Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski has no doubts that the old continent will need to step up. Europe needs to swiftly take more responsibility for its safety. This means spending more on defense and making strong decisions on migration policies. Poland is already doing what our allies will only begin to do. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk congratulated Trump on his victory on social media. A few days prior, somewhat predicting this result, the Polish PM reaffirmed his government's take on Europe's future. Some claim that the future of Europe depends on the American elections, while it depends first and foremost on us, on condition Europe finally grows up and believes in its own strength. Whatever the outcome, the era of geopolitical outsourcing is over. The overall message of Europe relying on itself more than likely has to do with Donald Trump's vague promise of ending the war in Ukraine. While he seems very confident, before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It will be settled quickly, quickly. It's still not clear what his plan on ending the war exactly is, in case he intends to cut the U.S.'s robust funding for Kyiv, which he hinted at during his pre-election speeches. European countries need to be ready for any scenario. Hence Poland's plan to spend close to 5% of GDP on defense in 2025. What we can do is invest in our security. Poland is doing more than just meeting the threshold. We're a leader when it comes to defense spending in NATO. While the final votes are still being counted, it's clear that the Americans are heavily divided. Both candidates oscillate around 50 percent, with Trump barely crossing that mark so far. In Poland, the conservative opposition is celebrating his victory. Polish President Andrzej Duda, hailing from the right-wing Law and Justice Party, was one of the first world leaders to congratulate the Republican candidate. He is also Donald Trump's longtime friend. Congratulations, Mr. President Donald Trump. You made it happen. Members of the ruling center liberal coalition are not nearly as thrilled as the conservative parties. I'll be frank, I wouldn't vote for him. First of all, Kamala is a woman. And secondly, her views are closer to mine. But we respect the Americans' choice. Former Polish president Lech Wałęsa has gone even further and spared no harsh words for the US president-elect. The United States has given a terrible example to the rest of the world. How can you choose a president with such history of bad choices and actions? It's a disgrace for the whole world. Here in Poland, the wind of history has indeed reached us from beyond the Atlantic Ocean. But the question still remains for many Poles whether Donald Trump can truly end the war in Ukraine and ensure the security of not only Kyiv, but also Warsaw and the rest of Europe. From the Polish capital, Kazimierz Wyszak, TVP World. Now, we also asked residents of Warsaw for their thoughts on the U.S. election results. Now, while some expressed optimism about Trump's leadership, particularly his potential to negotiate with President Putin, others expressed concerns, especially in light of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Now, here's what Warsaw locals had to say to our reporter, Aisha Abache. 
No, I think it will be difficult for everyone, but uh, well, let's see. I follow the election closely. Like, I'm happy that he won. Um, we could say he was like the lesser evil. The war in Ukraine, I guess, it's quite important. But for Poland, uh, I guess Harris would be much more better. I don't think it's going to be a big changes. Still, Europe is a strong ally. And yeah, I think we'll be still a good, good, good cooperation. Donald Trump is the president of United States, and he will like mm, pursue those interests of Americans. And it depends on our government uh, how this uh, this man will affect our politics. Now, a new president in the White House means a new Ukraine policy. Our Ukraine correspondent Oz Katerji joins us now live from Kiev with the latest. Good evening, Oz. Now, what is the reaction from Ukraine to this news today? Um, I know that uh, President Zelensky uh, did take on earlier to, of course, post his congratulatory remarks uh, to uh, Donald Trump. Now, particularly, what can you say this means for U.S. aid to Kiev under this Trump administration now? Well, I mean, look, clearly the, they are going to be disappointed in Kyiv, uh, the government here, uh, in, in the choice of U.S. president, uh, because one was much more favorable publicly so uh, towards aid towards Ukraine. But it must be said that the, the Zelensky administration has been preparing for this diplomatically for some time now. So it's no surprise at all he was one of the first world leaders to congratulate very warmly Donald Trump on his election victory. Now, I was on the streets of Kyiv earlier today talking to the residents here to try and gauge some of their reaction. There was a lot of nervousness on the streets. Let's take a listen to that. A lot of Ukrainians think that negotiation that Trump is supporting isn't the right choice for Ukraine and that the war won't continue, won't stop as easy as, as he says it will. We believe that everything will be fine. The war will be stopped. I hope that we get some uh, military aid. But I think everything is going to be okay. I think they have some kind of inside uh, things in the White House, and after this, everything is going to be fine. It will affect European leaders to make uh, strong actions and to be more confident and be more radical in their solutions. I, I'm support, uh, supporting uh, Donald Trump. I think uh, uh, he will uh, stand with Ukraine. So some mixed reactions there uh, from Ukrainian residents, but the general feeling uh, overall, uh, particularly amongst those politically aware, those, those are engaged journalists, political commentators, analysts here, there is a lot of despair and a lot of pessimism for uh, what they see as a, a, a White House that's going to be quite uh, apathetic to their struggle here. So look, a lot remains to be seen as to what Donald Trump's Ukraine policy will actually be. The skepticism that he won't be able to end the war uh, is, is very solid. Uh, so beyond that, we don't really know beyond things he said on the campaign trail. So a lot to be, to be nailed on uh, before he comes into office and after he comes into office. So a lot in the air and a lot of very nervous residents here in Ukraine. I imagine, of course, uh, and what the future has to hold for Ukraine in the weeks and months to come. Thank you so much, Oz Katerji, live from Kiev in Ukraine. Now, Trump's victory, as we heard, does cast a shadow over the war in Ukraine. Now, the U.S. president-elect has repeatedly said he would end the conflict, noting his good relations with Vladimir Putin. This promise, however, raises concerns in Kiev. Our Yeremi Khovodnyuk reports. Following Donald Trump's win, questions have emerged. What about the war in Ukraine and Washington's support for the war-torn country? During the campaign, Trump reiterated that he was in a position to end the conflict. This is a war that has to end, and we're going to get that war ended. I'm going to try, and I think I can, get it ended as president-elect. In other words, before I even take over the White House. In an interview with TVP World, a former European commissioner said this scenario, however, raised questions about its possibility and implications for the region. Everybody knows that it, it would be impossible, but he would be more open uh, and more conciliant uh, towards Russia. And this is a very dangerous behavior, uh, especially for countries like Poland. Despite Trump stating he has good relations with Putin, the Kremlin's reaction to his win has been rather cautious. Because the United States is the country that inflames and constantly throws gasoline into this conflict and takes a direct involvement in it, then yes, 
the United States is able to change this trajectory of its foreign policy. But whether it is done and how it is done, if at all, again we will see after January. Chairman of the Russian Security Council Dmitry Medvedev, known for his harsh rhetoric meanwhile, openly stated that Trump's win was a blow for Kyiv. Trump has one quality that is useful to us. As a businessman to the core, he morally dislikes spending money on various hangers-on and freeloaders on idiotic allies and stupid charity projects and glutinous international organizations. Toxic Bandera Ukraine is in the same role. President Zelensky, meanwhile, has congratulated Trump on his victory, voicing hopes for continued support for Ukraine. I appreciate President Trump's commitment to the peace through strength approach in global affairs. This is exactly the principle that can practically bring just peace in Ukraine closer. I am hopeful that we will put it in action together. Trump's return, however, spills uncertain times for the U.S. support for Kyiv. Uh, Zelensky is in a difficult situation. I mean, uh, Trump didn't have exactly a good press before uh, uh, today's result, and uh, all the fears in Ukraine were that he would sell Ukraine down the river, make a deal with uh, Putin. Donald Trump will be sworn in in January, and only then will the full implications of his promises materialize. Donald Trump is back as president of the United States and his return has the world watching closely. Now with Europe, NATO and Ukraine hanging in the balance, what does another Trump term mean for our region, especially for Poland and Ukraine? Now to help us understand the potential shifts in this U.S. policy, I'm joined by Daniel Fried, former U.S. ambassador to Poland. Mr. Fried, thank you so much for being with us uh, here this evening. Cała przyjemność po mojej stronie. Dobry wieczór. Good evening. So, sir, uh, the really most famous here question. Now, what are your initial thoughts on Trump's victory and the broader implications here for U.S.-Europe relations, uh, particularly concerning NATO? We don't know what Trump will do as president in his second term. That's an unknown. And people who say that they do know for sure aren't telling the truth, either to you or to themselves. The fact is that Trump will put more pressure on Europe to step up with defense spending and to step up and take more responsibility for its own security. So, so to that extent, Foreign Minister Sikorsky is absolutely right. His call earlier today for Europe to do more for its own defense is spot on, both substantively it helps and it will help as Poland deals with the new Trump administration. So this is something for Europeans to consider. They may not like Trump, but it doesn't matter. Trump will be the next president. Therefore, they must make the best of it. And one way to do that is to strengthen their capacity for autonomous action. And that includes military capacity so they can defend themselves. Critically important. Do you think that we'll see increased pressure, though, as you're mentioning right now, on European countries, including Poland, to contribute more to their defense budgets? Well, Poland is already doing its part. It is acting with speed and determination. Its military budget is high, and Trump world in the United States is aware of this. They look on Poland as, well, let's say the good European. And so Poland is in a position to speak to Trump. Uh, President Duda has a long-standing good relationship with Trump that he is using. I'm, I favor that. Foreign Minister Sikorski understands the American right, and I hope he uses that. And other Polish leaders, I'm thinking of uh, Mayor Chaskowski, uh, is very capable when he speaks to Americans. So there is a way that Poland can play an important role. And its message to Trump could be something like, well, we are actually doing a lot to shoulder our share of the defense burden. And here is why helping Ukraine is helping all of us. So I think that would be Poland's message. And I think it's a good message. Poland does have some ability to get to Trump, and I hope it uses it. Mr. Former Ambassador, now, do you think that Trump's victory now means that the U.S. will withdraw support from Ukraine? Not necessarily. 
Trump has said that occasionally, but his last meeting with President Zelensky was reasonably good. Trump likes to make deals. He likes to put pressure on the person he's speaking to to get a better deal. It is possible that, not certain, but possible that Trump will seek, as you said earlier, to end the conflict, but not necessarily and hopefully not on Putin's terms. Look, I'm not against all negotiations. I'm against dumb ones. And it would be dumb to negotiate with Putin about Ukraine on his terms without the Ukrainians. The, fa the central question is, what security will ha Ukraine will have after this phase of the war is done? What do Neutrality you predict? What do you predict? Work. Gray zones don't work. And what do you predict those security guarantees to be exactly? Well, all the way, you know, the best guarantees, the gold standard is, of course, NATO membership. Um, the second best, the silver standard, would be actual, robust, verifiable uh, agreements with the United States, Poland, the British, others maybe in a coalition of the willing, so Ukraine doesn't stand alone if Russia attacks, and Russia knows it. Poland can play a part. Poland should not be asked to shoulder this burden alone. The Americans have to be in this. And it's possible Trump would consider something like this if the Europeans were doing their part. This is speculation on my part. I don't know, but there is a good, there is a reasonable chance that Trump will not act on his worst rhetoric. Now, how do you think that Poland and, of course, Europe um, might respond if Trump's administration now decides uh, to uh, cut this financial and military support uh, for Ukraine and if this is scaled back? I mean, how, what might the strategic uh, impacts be, the economic impacts uh, of that be? I mean, Ukrainians uh, seem pretty worried. Of course the Ukrainians are worried, and in their place I would worry also. I don't think it is necessarily the case that Trump will cut aid. I think his instinct will be to do a deal. And I think the Ukrainians would be well advised to work with him as much as possible. The fact is, though, that Europe has to be ready to do more for its own defense. This, is, this would be the case if Harris were elected president. Europe needs to do more. Poland is in a position to lead Europe uh, because Polish politics is in, frankly, better shape. There's a consensus in Poland about standing up to Putin's aggression and a consensus about helping Ukraine and a consensus on stronger national defense. So I think Poland is in a good place to play a leadership role in Europe, working with other powers, of course, like the British, the, the Finns, Swedes, and hopefully the Germans. Uh, the French, and Poland can do this and thus enable it, uh, enable the stronger powers of Europe, the more determined powers of Europe to work with Trump in a constructive way. What do you think that Trump's administration is going to look like in his the second term in office the, this time around? Is it going to differ from his first? Well, first, I don't know. I'm not in inner Trump world. We'll see by the people he appoints. There is in the American media a, an idea circulating that there are no people in the Trump camp now who believe in NATO or the free world or transatlantic security, and that happily is not true. There are people who believe in it. There are others who are more skeptical. And you can believe, you better believe that within Trump world there will be differences and a, an intense internal discussion and Europeans, including Poles, are not without the ability to affect that debate. And the way they can affect it is by offering to, to do more for their own defense um, as part of a deal with the United States. You, America, stay in Europe, work with us, and we Europeans will step up. That's a deal that Trump might respond to. Well, he sure is a businessman. We'll definitely see how that will unfold. Thank you so much, Mr. Daniel Fried, former U.S. ambassador to Poland, for being with us here on TVP World on World News Tonight on this My historic pleasure. Thank day. You. And this completes uh, this special edition of World News Tonight here on TVP World. Stay with us as we continue to cover the U.S. presidential elections. I'm Diana Skaya. Have a good night.